Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs. We hope you're keeping very, very safe and well on pretty much everything pretty non-Tottenham Hotspur related at the moment. If you're listening to the show for the first time, you can find us on iTunes or on Spotify or across all major audio platforms. We're, of course, on Twitter at Last Word on Spurs. We're on Facebook and Instagram too. And the last time I saw this man, he wasn't as broken as probably what he is now. And if this man's broken, then we really are, really are in, um, well in a difficult, difficult place. Joining me on this one, my co-host for the show, before we introduce our great guest, we've got Lee McQueen back on last month's Spurs. Macca, how are you, bud? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm not too bad. I'm just, I'm still fighting my way through the forest of abuse from Arsenal fans after my, uh, after my little episode on Sky Sports, which, by the way, I was absolutely fanboy and loved it to pieces. So uh, I don't care what the Gooners said. I, 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 I picked a team to, uh, to rile them. And I definitely did that. Um, but, uh, you know, they had the last laugh, didn't they, at the weekend, to be fair. Uh, they played uh, good, some good football. Uh, they've been playing better football than us all season. We didn't have an answer for them. And that is a real, real hard one to take. I think that when you look at social media, when you look at the fans around us in the stadium, I, obviously I sit in the South Stand, as most people know. Um, it's hard. It's really, really tough. But, you know, the, the it, it's... Some, sometimes you're not judged on, you know, when the times are good, you're judged on the times are bad. And we've had some bad times along the way. Um, so, you know, it, it's time to try and pick ourselves up. I've got nothing left. I've got nothing to give the viewers and the listeners a form of positive note, only the fact that the last time Arsenal smashed a, a, an Antonio Conte team um, was when he was a manager at Chelsea. And that was a time when he went from a back four to a back three. So maybe against Man City, he, he tries something different and it swings our season for... 15 winning streak like it did Chelsea. But look, all jokes aside, but I don't think any of us think that's going to happen. And there's some some tough times ahead of us. But uh, I think we've got to stick with the manager um, and we've got to back him. And we've got to, a little bit like Arteta. Arteta was bottom of the league last season. They were finished two eighth place finishes and they backed him. And now they're top of the league and run away with it. So that's my view on that. I know we don't want to talk about Arsenal tonight, but it's it's the catalyst really, isn't it? Um, uh, Rick and, and, and Darren for, for where we are right now. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. Now, when I reached out to this man a couple of months ago, I don't think he probably thought when he was coming on, he probably be here as a, almost like a Samaritan for us to try and lift the mood, especially when I'm joined by Lee McQueen, who doesn't normally need lifting, but my God, we do need some lifting tonight and to understand exactly what's happening with our football club at the moment. We're joined by the brilliant uh, Daily Mirror football correspondent, Darren Lewis, back on last one on Spurs. Dal, thanks for giving us so much of your time. How are you, my friend? I'm really good, thank you. Uh, thanks to you and to Lee uh, for having me on and um, to the warm reception as well that I've had for coming on here. I'm just really sad and sorry that I'm coming on at probably your worst moment of the season because not just losing in the fashion that you did to Arsenal, but also finding yourselves in a position where you're looking up at Arsenal when you were looking down at them last season and... You know, I know, Maki, you were saying that you don't really want to talk about Arsenal, but it, it, it's, listen, everyone listening, you they know how it works. You know, it makes it even worse that you see your bitter rivals across the road or down the Seven Sisters Road just flying at the moment and getting everything right. And even when things don't go their way, you know, you saw last summer they missed out on Douglas Louise on deadline day and then they end up seeing, you know, party running midfield alongside Jacker and everything kind of falling into the place. And you do need a bit of luck as far as transfers are concerned that they've had that. You guys, you've had no luck and things have gone to horrendously for you. That's funny because uh, me and Lee were joking off air saying there should be a quiet one tonight, not much to discuss. <laughs> 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 only, the whole Honestly, basis of the, only the whole basis of the football club. You know, I thought having that <clears throat> World Cup break, my wife said to me, it's the most relaxed and chill she'd seen me in six years. And I think the last week, it looks like I've aged about 10 years from this football club, what it's doing to us. Honestly, quite is. When you're doing, obviously, we love doing last one on Spurs. We know we're here after every single game. Mentally, it's test. We know it's only football, but obviously to many people, uh, football is our lives. And, you know, it's what we wake up to. It's what we go to bed to. We dream. We have that right to dream as football fans. And I don't think we should ever stop dreaming. And um, look, as Billy says there, Darren's voice is very soothing. We're going to need a lot more of that, most certainly in this show. But as I always say on last one on Spurs, I think there is that conception that um, there's certain topics off limit. There's nothing, anything off limit on last one on Spurs. We discuss the board, we discuss the players, we discuss the manager. And if you've been listening to last one on Spurs over the last five, six years, we always do that. 
you know, we don't do that in an element of where it's swearing and it's shouted and it's ranting. We try and do that logically. And that's why, like I say, we have on wonderful guests like Darren that can try and help us understand exactly what is going on with Tottenham. We are conscious that Conte has held a press conference today. We will bring that into the element of the show. But I suppose we have to start right towards the top. And I know many will probably want to start on the board. We are going to start with the ball. But at the moment, we need to try and understand what's actually happening with the manager, if we can try and understand what's happening with the manager. Dow, look, I'll be honest, I think the biggest problem with Spurs at the moment is that it feels like the club is, in my opinion, pretending to be something that they simply aren't willing to be at the moment. I think when we hired Antonio Conte, he was aware and we were aware as fans of what he would have demanded as a head coach, as a manager, to be successful at Tottenham. Now, it just feels at the moment that the club is heading into such a lack of a direction where we're not being given any real communication as to what's happening at the moment. We're 17 days into a transfer window and it feels from the outside looking in that we don't even know who we're buying the players for, whether it's for this manager, whether it's for another manager. Conte just seems, I can only look at his press conference for me personally, reading body language. He just seems like he's going through the motions at the moment. He seems like a man that has got the writing on the wall, and bearing in mind that Spurs are in a position where they've lost four of their last five league home games. They're currently five points adrift of the top four with City to come on Thursday. Are you able to give us an understanding, in your view, of just what is happening right now at the football club? Well, th- there is general concern. Uh, that there is no point sugarcoating that. If you look at the top four, Tottenham will play a game more, yet the top four are to five points clear, and they're very likely to pull away. There is a slight smidgen of hope, if you like, in so much as City don't look like the City of last season. They've been unconvincing the last three or four games. And so there's a real chance that you could maybe go into that match believing that there are vulnerabilities that you can take advantage of. But certainly alarm bells... Do I want to say alarm bells? Conti's press conference was fascinating this afternoon because he did talk about why... Other people at the club didn't speak. He He's somebody who doesn't like to be the front man for things that he clearly, given what he was saying, doesn't agree with. And so, and we know what kind of club Spurs are, like any club, to be fair. I remember Scott Parker at Bournemouth earlier this season came out and said a, a set of things that the ownership didn't take kindly to. Um but you know what you get with Antonio Conte. He's a very honest guy and he finds it hard not to be. And I, I saw someone just messaging a second ago saying, look, uh, Conte talks in riddles. Uh, what Conte does is get as close to saying what he wants to say before he bites his tongue. And clearly what he seems to be suggesting is that he has a frustration at seeing Arsenal so dominant, so decisive in the transfer market and so far clear of Spurs, given that Spurs finished in the top four at Arsenal's expense last season. And to an extent, I think he he, he does make, a, you know, a, a, a point that you can understand. Here's the thing, though. When all of the transfer business was done last summer, I bet you both and the people listening at the moment were very happy with the business and very happy with the depth. Would that be fair? I'll be honest. Yeah. I mean, uh, Lee, you want to go first? I was going to say, first, yeah. I mean, I think Longley was a, is a, you know, we tried to get Bastoni. I think everybody knows that I wanted Bastoni. Loads of people did. The Guardia, I think that at that period of time, certainly probably now after the World Cup, he's well out of reach. But a Bastoni, you know, would have been a perfect left side and centre back for for the system and for Conte working alongside Perisic, Perisic up and down that left hand side working with Conte as well and we just couldn't we couldn't find a guy I think this, the, the problem with Tottenham is we could go and, and not that we do this by the way ever, ever, as everyone knows but we could have gone and given eight in Milan eighty million and he still might not have come because he didn't want to come play for Tottenham so you know it is a di- it is a difficult one on there although I would say go and put eighty million down. Pedro Poro, uh, at the moment, it's, it's exactly the same scenario, right? He's got a release clause. Go and pay the release clause. I know there's complications that might happen behind it. Some people understand and some people don't. But in the, at the end of the day, the player wants to come. The club wants to sell for the price that they want to sell at. 
you know, there's always that happening at the board level. It, it never seems to to be the same. It, you know, it's always the same. Do, do you see where I'm coming from? So, but coming back to your question about the summer, yeah, I think you know the amount of signings that we brought in. Perisic has been fantastic, eight nine assists this season. Um, you know, Basuma. In hindsight, not a good signing, but at the time, absolutely outstanding signing. He was one of the best out, probably outside of top six midfielders in the Premier League. He was a superb signing. Um, so to bring in long layers as, as a kind of a stopgap because you couldn't get our number one target, you kind of go, okay, we can work with that. But now, actually, when you're looking back on it, and bearing in mind, we've had a record start to a Premier League. This is not like in the last five years, in the last six, this is ever in 30 years, it was our best ever start for a Premier League. So the the reality of the of of the drop off Darren and Ricky has been is just been monumental. It's like it's absolutely right. five points outside of the top four, and they've got game in hand. Rick said to us on the WhatsApp group the other day, "We're going to get nowhere near the top four, and I absolutely battered him for it. I was like, "What are you on about?" Now all of a sudden, we're thinking, "Man, this could be true." So I think the summer was was a good stepping stone. It was a good start, but it also proves that Tottenham. The way we are and the way who we are, and we got to, we got to face this ourselves. We've got to look in the mirror ourselves. We can't go and buy the top players. We've, we we cannot go and do it. The last world class, proper, unbelievable player we signed, which was a proper wow signing. You could argue maybe a Van der Vaart, certainly Jurgen Klinsmann. But that was like back in the mid nineties. So there's there's our problem. Like Guardiola's never going to come to us because any of the other major super clubs can come and buy him. Does that make sense? And I'll just add on to that, Dale, very quick before you come back in there. For me, like, I always feel under this current ownership. And look, you know, I'm going to be honest, we have got an incredible training ground, incredible stadium. And why is when I say that? But to, to caveat that, because many people feel I've got, an, I've got some kind of connection towards the club, which believe me, like I say, my only connection is to see Spurs be successful. That's for me, it's not about balled in, balled out, manager in, manager out. The most important thing to me is seeing Tottenham Hotspur successful. And I feel that under this current ownership, in every single window since they've been here, I always feel that we are always at least a couple of players short. I don't feel in the last 20 years I've come out of a window and ever felt, right, we're ready to go. I always feel that we're a couple of players short. And it's those couple of players that, for me, ultimately make the difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> listen, the reason why Arsenal are where they are at the moment is because they've spent huge amounts of money to get there. And some players that they've spent big on, haven't worked out. It's very easy to look at Arsenal and say they've done so much better than Spurs have in the transfer window. But you look at some of the centre halves that they've brought into the club. You look at some of uh, the forwards they've brought into the club. Right. Um, you know they, they've spent a lot of money. They've seen a lot of money go up in smoke at the club. But it's the most recent ones that they've got right. And tellingly, as you were saying, Lee. They've stuck by the managers through difficult moments because they've had a very unified plan. And it's, it, I saw somebody, and listen, I, I've been looking at the comments while you've been talking, Maka, and yourself, Rick, and, you know, the, the fans are talking so much sense, in some cases more than me, you know, because it is a combination of things. The one thing I do want to pick up on is a word that's popped up a couple of times, lies, because I don't think there have been lies from the club. I, I really don't think there have been. We all, you all, looked, certainly us in the media and you guys within the fan base, you had so much optimism when the club released that statement saying that they would, the ownership would release £150 million more to back Conte in the window. That's what you'd been calling for. And the club showed that they were prepared to listen to what the fans were saying. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you in so much as I, I don't want to sit here characterising the club as liars and unwilling to be ambitious. They were trying to do with what they could within the parameters of their spending capacity. They brought in Richarlison, £50 million striker. Had they not signed him and Richarlison had been doing bits in, in, in the World Cup, you guys are going, Richarlison, that's the kind of striker we're signed, but we've got no ambition, so of course we're not going to go with him. Well, they did, and you've got him. You've been very unlucky that he's been injured during the period he has been. You've been unlucky with Robert, uh, with, with Rodrigo Bentenko that he's been injured. Um, you've been unlucky, and there's no way to sugarcoat it, that you've got a goalkeeper who, you know, he's had a wonderful time at the club, and we love Hugo Lloris, but 
you know, he, he needs challenging. He needs serious top-class competition. Um, and there are things that you simply cannot lay at the door of the ownership. It's the easiest thing in the world to do that. And I could come here and play well with, with, with the guys listening and, and say the kind of things that, you know, the kind of reactionary things that will get me on side with you and hammer the club. But it just wouldn't be fair to them because there are some things that have happened so far this season that are simply beyond their control. And everyone's grasping for the key reason, the one thing that has seen the club fall behind. And everyone is desperate to demonise Daniel Levy because it's the easy thing to do. Lots of people have grown up on Levy taking stick from fans. But the facts are there. They released that money. They spent it. They provided that depth. Remember when people said a decent striker won't come to the club because they don't want to sit on the bench behind Harry Kane? You know, you've got Richarlison who's come in there and you're right. Maybe it might take a little bit of time before Bissouma becomes the player that you want him to be or the player that was at Brighton. Um, but, you know, sometimes players need time. Brian Hill, when you first signed him, and people said he's so raw, he should be in the butchers. And suddenly, um, he looks a player. And I was at... Uh, he's been Palace. forced, hasn't he, Dale, though, on that? Just on Brian Hill. He's yes, been forced but... to play him due to the injuries. I, I just think what I want to ask you is, so in your opinion, you don't think the goalposts have been moved at all in terms of Conte and the board? Because I think that's what people are trying to understand that. I'll tell you, I think what people want to understand is that there doesn't seem to be, yeah. as Conte alluded to earlier in his press conference, that, you know, nobody comes out and explains the vision. In Italy, you do have the managing director, i.e. Paratigi, who actually, on a frequent basis for Juventus, would be the man, the spokesman, that would address the fan base and let them know what position the club was going in. We don't seem to have that at Tottenham. You know, Daniel Bless Daniel, well, you know, Daniel doesn't frequently give interviews. So as we understand, Daniel is not a man that is comfortable in front of the camera. He doesn't feel confident to give interviews. But at the same time, I think that is the biggest issue that we don't have an open line of communication to know what the direction is, what the philosophy is. And I think if we had that as a fan base, if we had some form of a guide, because under Pochettino, whatever you say about Poch, we all knew what we were building for. We were building towards a brand new stadium. We were building towards that. We had a young, vibrant team that, as we saw towards the end there of a cycle, needed refreshing. We decided to not give Pochettino that rebuild. And almost now looking at it, we've spent 18, 24 months with Jose. We're here with Conte. And my problem is that I don't know what has happened in between that time right now. And we've seen to, there's been massive blurred lines as to what the vision is. Now, I'm not saying the club have to come out every window and tell us that or every month and tell us that. But I feel where we are right now is that there is such a lack of a direction as to what we're trying to achieve that if that would be addressed, I think a lot of this anger and frustration would calm down. And I don't think it helps when, you no know, Conte, as I've said in my lifetime, one of the best managers, I, I think, you look at his CV, five titles in the last eight seasons. I can't understand why he almost talks about Tottenham as if we're a mid-table team. That, that's another thing that I, I am getting rolled out about when I see him on the press conferences. And I know, listen, Ali Gold, massive respect to Ali, and Ali makes that point that, you know, it's almost like he was at a michelin star restaurant before and is now being served up fast food at Tottenham. And I do, I, I do have to agree with that because, you know, Spurs, although, listen, we're not an elite super club, but we have in the last four or five years gone and attracted those managers. And that's my biggest frustration. If you're going to go and attract those managers, they have to have sufficient backing. And I think that's where the frustration is, is that in this process, in the last four or five years, who is moving these goalposts? Because the trend just seems very, very coincidental that this keeps on happening, Darren. Do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah. 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 I mean, did you think goalposts have been moved? Or do you think that in this season, there was a belief that maybe Conte could improve... Emerson Rail, for example, and they discovered that they hadn't, <laughs> or there was a, a faith that maybe um, certain other players who have been there for quite some time, if again, and that is another justifiable criticism. You could say it that's been leveled at the club that there are too many players that are, are still at the club that was signed nearly a decade. Absolutely, decade ago. so if true. You look at, if you look Dyer, at Sanchez, club, Mora, Son, Kane, Hugo. Some of those players are legends that it will be a travesty if they do not win a trophy at Tottenham. But at the same time, it's also a travesty that what we haven't done 
is also upgraded <clears throat> around those players to make so, us in a position to win. Sorry, Lee. Conte, Conte mentioned today in his press conference about mentality, and he actually laughed and said, look, if it was if it was just about mentality, we would have fixed the problem by now. It's not about mentality. My players have a fantastic mentality. But Darren and Ricky, you just you just um you know just hit the nail on the head, like, like Gavin's just said as well. From from playing under Poch, we still got people that are that are starting matches at the weekend. Kane, Son, Lucas, Larice, Dyer, Davis, Skip, Cess, Sanchez. They, they, they're, they're in and around the squad or they're still starting. So some of them are world class players, or two of them, uh, you could maybe you, you could argue. But when you look at Arsenal, Arsenal Wenger's last game was the 13th of May 2018. And the only players they've got left in their squad is um, or play is Zaka and Rob Holding. And then Ketier, who was a youngster. That's the only players they've got left. And what they did is they brought in um, Emery, um, Unai Emery, and it didn't really work out for him or whatever. I think it was a little unfair with him, but you could say the board was a little bit was ruthless with him. The fans had lots of protests at that football club, why, why Tottenham were kind of like going above them, looking down on them again and all like that. They had lots of protests. And whatever changed, they started to pull the money out and um, people were talking about the director of football getting the, getting the boot, and but they didn't. They stuck with Edu and they stuck with Arteta, bringing him in and they've, they've backed him. Had two bad seasons in terms of eighth and eighth. I think they've won an FA Cup as well, which is something that Tottenham haven't done since 1991. So even through their tough times, they've still won trophies. Yet when now we sit in here, we were... Four points behind them with three games to go last season, and we beat them to the top four. They're now fourteen points clear of us with a game in hand. So that's 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 a mad turnaround. When you look at Klopp, and I know obviously Liverpool are close to you down as well, like you follow Liverpool, you know report Liverpool now as well. When Klopp first came in, that sliding doors moment I think was against Tottenham, the four-one defeat at Wembley, um, when your your the central defender I can't remember his name. Um, Love them got absolutely rinsed, and the rinse, the, the sliding doors moment was Klopp was like, right, I, I need changes. Go and buy seventy five million Van Dijk. Go and buy seventy million Allison in the summer. You know, made six or seven signings that season. They had a twenty two point swing from where they finished the season before. That's what Arsenal are currently doing right now as we talk. Why can't Tottenham do that? Because mm. Tottenham Hotspur Football Club do not act in the way that Liverpool, Manchester United, Man City. Arsenal's the big clubs, the elite clubs. That's the way they. That's the way they act. And Tottenham have the money to be able to do it. They have world class players. They've got a world class manager. And the, the, my criticism of Tottenham Hotspur in terms of the football club is, when you talk about the world class stadium and all that sort of stuff, Rick, and the infrastructure, what what a link are absolutely amazing at. What their portfolio is amazing at is exactly what they've done. They've made us have the best stadium in the world, in my opinion. It is absolutely amazing. We, we've got unbelievable training ground facilities. And what they've done is they've done something brilliant. What I haven't been good enough, w w with the greatest respect, is on the footballing side. The footballing decisions at this football club, the recruitment over that period of time. You mentioned Poch earlier, Rick. We did not back that man. This is a guy that you cut him open, he's Tottenham Hotspur, 518 days without making a signing. We got to the Champions League final. And probably, Darren, you might argue this to be fair, um, we were a better team in the final uh, from a statistics perspective. We lost the finals very, very close, close margins. I don't have a problem with losing finals or semi-finals. Mm. But when you're a Tottenham fan and you haven't won anything for so long, that's when it becomes desperate. That's when it becomes, it's not even a banner anymore. The banner doesn't even bother me personally. Like, oh, you didn't want a trophy? Yeah, okay, tell us ain't new. It's the fact that nothing changes every mm. single time. Harry Redknapp. Oh, I could go for a, I could go for a title push. He gets Ryan Nelson, you know. Um, Joe Roden uh, comes in instead of a Scrinyar from Mourinho. Like you know, we wanted Bastoni, we get Longley. I mean, it's constantly on the go every time. And what breaks me the most about the weekend? I was there, um, obviously, like like everyone else was um, in the stadium, sixty two thousand people, and we. If you analyse it, if you take the emotion out of it, we didn't actually play that badly in the second half. We didn't actually play that bad, and you know, if you know, we, Rick, we actually didn't. If you, if I don't you think you. I, I want to get. I want to bring Dale back in, but I don't think it was at the. It was not for me at a level enough. But what? I was, yeah, I was going to just, just yeah. let me finish on that. What I was going to say was, 
is that we didn't actually play massively bad, but because of everything that's going on and the fact that we didn't, we, we couldn't break that down. The, the, the biggest game uh, at home when we ruined them last season, absolutely, what was Gary Neville's words, we beasted them, that crowd beasted them. Nothing the same. Nothing the same. The, the change is completely different. And that's why it's hard to take, lads, listeners, viewers. Yeah, listen, I, I, I agree with all of that. The, the only thing I I'd, I'd slightly would, would tweak is that um, <clears throat> Bastoni didn't want to come. I, I don't think it was a question of the club not being willing to pay for him. Bastoni had the chance to come. I think his contract is running down um, and he hasn't signed a new one, as I understand it. And there had been a belief that they could get him in the summer because like you, I, I think he's a super player and Conte thinks the world of him. And maybe had he come they would have been able to play with a four. Full disclosure to everyone listening, we were talking about this off air and we were uh, chat, chatting about why he's sticking with a system rather than going to a four. And what I was saying was that Tottenham can't defend at the moment. I think it's one clean sheet in the last eight games. Yeah. And if you were to go to a four, that record, you, you'd concede more goals because it simply isn't the protection for uh, that defence. And of course, there isn't that confidence in the goalkeeper sadly that you can go to a four and go toe to toe with some of the teams that at the moment are ripping Spurs apart in first halves of games and by the time Spurs start to play in the second half of games the game is beyond them and one or two games you can get something out of them and a late goal from Harry whatever how long does he carry the team on his back and the, the I tell you what a worry is the worry is that you know, a big club comes in. We know Bayern Munich's interest, for example. A big club says, come and win trophies with us. This is the players that we've got. And then what do you do as a football club? Um, and, and that's the reason why this really is a pivotal moment. And the next couple of weeks in particular are key because what's very obvious is that, for example, you guys could have signed Tommy Asu. And he's gone to Arsenal. He can't even get in their first team because they've got Ben White playing at right back. Sorry, I can't do. I, I can't replay Conte. I couldn't afford the wage cut. Um, I think. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Dale, you might get a full. You might get a full ninety out of him for one game. This might be nice. To see. <laughs> but I think. I think. I think, um, I think as far as far as um, that quality is concerned, in those positions, left side, centre half, right full back. A goalkeeper to challenge Hugo. Um, even another forward. I know there's an interest in Zaniolo at Roma, the 23 year old. He's a wonderful player. He could be um, a real asset and give you that depth, but particularly with Mora not in the plans. He's had a terrible time with injuries. He's going to leave at the end of the season. I, I just. I think you guys have been horrendously unlucky. I know that there is that anger with the club and, and, and you know, lots of people articulating in the comments exactly why it's not unjustified anger and it's not just giving the club stick for the sake of it. It's a frustration, a, a justified frustration that being ahead, as you were saying, Lee, of them last season and seeing them overtake. Um, but there are reasons. There, there is a combination of reasons and not all of them I have to be fair. Not all of them you can lay at the club store. Can I ask you, Dale? Because I, I, no, I think I think lots of people just want to want to know these questions because we're a half an hour when we actually haven't asked Dale probably the, the the million dollar question. And as I say this, uh, the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust have just now released a, a further statement to what they asked a couple of weeks ago. And they've actually asked for clarity, not in February but now. So just to bring Darren into context of that, if you're not aware, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Darren, the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust put four questions towards the ball. Predominantly one of them about the vision and the lack of communication from the club. The club responded and said they are very keen to answer these four questions. And they will do that upon the closure of the January transfer window in February with Fabio Paratigi, the managing director, who will be giving a statement on the back of that. And from that, we've seen today on the back of Conte's press conference that it seems it appears that Conte asked for the same thing in terms of, you know, outlining the fact that it's not a habit we see in England, where the managing director talks out in terms of giving, giving that vision. But uh, they've, the Tottenham Hospital Supporters Trust, just to be clear, have actually asked for some communication right now. Rather than at the end of 
the window and into February. They want that communication now. So can you maybe just, Darren, uh, I'm not expecting you to comment on that, but just predominantly, do you see Antonio Conte walking or do you see him staying at Tottenham between now and the end of the season? I don't see him walking. No, I think he stays, but I agree with the trust. I think there does need to be a dialogue. I'm not a big fan. No, let me rephrase that. I know at other clubs, there are fans that aren't big fans of people other than the owner speaking out. Now, I, I wouldn't be... I. I'm in the information business. I will never apologize for wanting to hear from as many people as possible. So I cannot possibly sit here and say I wouldn't want Paratici or Daniel Levy or you know somebody at the club to come and speak on behalf of the club and provide the clarity that you are saying or the trust is saying that they would like to have. All I'm saying is that other clubs and when the likes of David Sullivan at West Ham, for example, would speak out, a lot of the fans would say, we don't want you to be speaking all the time. Why don't you know? Why are you coming into the public domain? And understandably, Sullivan listened to the fans and he said, "Look, I'm going to leave it to the manager." And sometimes it's very easy to say that you should have other people at the football club talking about certain things. But then what happens is they come and they sit in the hot seat and they speak, and then someone else them questions that would be more appropriate for the manager. So and then they say, well, I can't ask this and I can't answer that. Um, I think as far as the trust is concerned, however, I do wholeheartedly agree with the idea and the demand for clarity because there is genuine concerns. There, there, there is anybody who looked at the way that the club played at the weekend could see that there are glaring deficiencies in the side that aren't to do with tactics and are to do with personnel. Anybody who looks at the squad can see that there are key areas where the club is deficient. Morale at the club within the squad isn't as high as it has been in the past. And the trajectory of Tottenham in relation to the clubs above them, you're going in different directions. So I always say fans have that financial as well as emotional investment in the team. They have a right to do things as the trust have been doing and articulating their concerns and asking for an answer and not at a point where, as you guys have been suggesting and they've been suggesting, it's too late, that nothing can be done. But at a point where the club can have something substantive in terms of a demand from the supporters to work with. And I, I think everyone, I'm seeing all the comments here, everyone is being very, very clear about what's needed. We haven't even got to the creative midfielder that uh, the club need to take the pressure off Harry, who seems to be dropping deeper and deeper to get the ball uh, when really you want him inside uh, the box. I think this is going to have to resolve itself fairly soon because I think if Tottenham finish outside the top four this season, I can't see when they get back into it. Arsenal are building. They have a very, very young team. Newcastle have the finance to go again and a superb defensive record. United are resurgent and they have a wonderful manager with a superb transfer strategy and City under Pep Guardiola are not going anywhere anytime soon. So that five-point gap right now could easily increase exponentially. And this, this next two weeks is Tottenham's big chance, maybe, to try and reel them in. The one thing is, now we've been speaking for half an hour. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. That's what's actually quite scary about Spurs, is that there is yeah. so much I could ask you about. I know we are uh, got to be conscious of time. I know people love that last one, Spurs, but there is so much I still want to ask you about. Darren nearly it? said it for you, but there's a lock picker in there. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was. <laughs> We're going to ask him. What what are so, so I know you want to go for a quick break, but because there's so much to get through, and Darren, your wisdom is epic. Like, I just want to say, you know, we talked about Bastoni. Um, there's a lot of people that play FIFA out there. I, I, I'm a newfound FIFA player. I'm, I have to say, in my old age is cr crazy. But there's a lot of people out there, you know, FIFA jokes aside, that would say, well, yeah, we could have got Bastoni. He might be running his contract down, but Chelsea would have got him. Like, Man City would have got him. If they if they put the phone up to Bastoni, he's on a plane. This is this is my point. It's not sometimes I'm not sticking up for the club or anything at the moment, but I'm Antonio Conte and I say. This is my vision. This is where I want to go. These are the players I need. If you give me this, I'm going to win you the league. 
that's pretty much what he's, he, he, he should have and probably would have been saying because he's, he's a winner and he's a confident guy and he knows that he can do it. So when he says, I want Bastoni, and we don't go and get Bastoni, and we say, oh, well, you know, we could we tried, but we couldn't get him. I, I get it. I get that, you know, I don't want to be a petulant child about it, but Chelsea would have signed him. Like, Chelsea would have got him. Man City would have got him. Chelsea's spending is, is, is through the roof. And we, we can spend, not that we may or may not have the money, that's another debate, but we can spend over 400 million without even being hit on financial fair play. You know, the, the stadium was a game changer. It is full every week. We've got concerts in there. We've got boxing uh, matches in there. We've got, we're doing 8 million revenue every single time that stadium is full, plus concerts and everything else that's going on. The NFL is unbelievable. I've been down there on a weekend when the NFL shop, they changed it over. I don't know if everyone's seen it or not, but it, it, in case you haven't, it is incredible what what the change of the merchandise that happens. I've done the tour not that long ago and went into the NFL changing room. It is unbelievable like what they've done at that football club from an infrastructure perspective. The money's coming. The money's coming in. We talked about earlier about that 150 million. They only drew 100 million down. Where's the other 50 million gone? Like it's not been drawn down. That you know, this is why I, I echo what the, the trust is saying and what you guys are saying is we just need to hear that we're in the middle of a transfer window. We haven't signed anyone for 15 days. We're desperate for signing. 18. By the time the show goes out, eight, 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 days. Days. we haven't even heard from Paratici. Don't even know where he is, right? And and and, and ultimately, what the scouts are brought in Simon Davis. We brought in the guy from Everton. You know, we changed our entire. And everybody just still talks about Levy. But Levy's not in charge of transfers anymore, isn't he? I thought he was our managing director of football. But no one's even talking about Paratici. Yeah, but that, that, that's such a good point. because, And this is the reason why it's almost... It's about weaning off the idea that Levy is the bad guy and Levy won't spend the money that's needed. You know, there are lots of other people who bear responsibility for where Spurs are. Yes, you got very fortunate last year. End of the window, you went out and got Kulusevski and Benton Kerr, and they ended up being fantastic players. That was because Paratici went back to his former club. But So where is the work that's being put in to get the players that Brentford managed to get and Brighton managed to get and sell on for huge amounts of money? Trossard now being hawked around uh, Caicedo being hawked around. cucurella has gone to Chelsea for sixty-two million pounds, mm -hmm. uh, and then they go away and they get Estepinian and bring him in uh, cheaply, in relative terms. It, it isn't all on Daniel Levy, and and I think there it, it is fair to say that one trophy in twenty-two years doesn't read particularly well, and it is true to say that if that is the case then maybe the way of doing things hasn't worked. And maybe it's a question of throwing money at it, or maybe it's a question of better scouting and bringing in better young players who can reach their potential and go on to bigger things at Tottenham. And then if you do surrender them, and everybody knows there is a food chain, you're selling them for big money that you can reinvest in the team. So it's a wider debate rather yeah. than perpetuating this idea that fans are being sold lies and this, that, and the other, because I don't think that is the case. And I don't think it helps this debate at all that around the club, if we are basically, you know, hurling stones at people rather than thinking about the way things work uh, in the round. Before we do go for our first break, just kind of say there's over a thousand of you watching us live. So again, thank you so much for all of your incredible support for Last Word on Spurs. Difficult, difficult show. Uh, but we're joined by the wonderful Lee McQueen and Darren Lewis from the Mirror here. Um, Darren, before we try and turn our attention away from the board, the manager, um, you said there for you, you don't think Conte is going to walk. So just final on, how, how does this resolve itself? Will it resolve itself? And what I'm asking is, is Conte going to sign a new contract? Or is there a case where at the end of the season, there'll just be a natural parting of ways? Because you're seeing at the moment that I think... There is a percentage of Spurs fans that simply aren't enjoying the brand of football at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're not enjoying the rigid formation, the uh, lack of tactical nounce substitutions as well as being questioned, the actual style when we have a five, ten minute period at the start of the game and we look really, really bright. We then seem to drift off and allow the opposition to take control and score a couple of goals. And then second half, we decide we are going to play 
and we're going to try and fight our way back into a game where two or three nil down and we might be able to try and get something. And the reason I say that is because this isn't just one game. We're looking at the last nine or ten games. That's why you do wonder, is this a template where it's a lack of coaching? Is there more where the players just simply aren't listening to the manager? Can you try and answer that as to how this is going to pan out and resolve itself if possible? I don't think Conte is going to walk away. I think, well, certainly not this month. I think there is the potential for that to happen in the summer, certainly, if the players don't come in uh, that Conte wants, that Conte believes will help the club to compete. Conte is not a man who competes outside the Champions League or for the Champions League places. He wants to be where Arsenal are at the moment. So I think if the players don't come in in this window of the ability that he needs then I think he will leave in the summer. His contract is up in the summer. Clearly, there is that option to extend, but why would he extend if um, he doesn't get that, you know, if he's going to be playing outside the top four uh, while the others are competing for the players that uh, will help them to have a shot at the title? And the other thing is, if he does leave, then you do have to worry about Son. You do have to worry about Kane. You do have to worry about Bayern. You do have to worry about clubs like Manchester United. They've got Veghorst on loan. But in the summer, when Veghorst goes back, if Manchester United say, we're back in the Champions League, we're a striker away from uh, competing for the title, come and join us. What does a Tottenham, who don't have the capability, the squad at that point, to compete for the title, say to Harry Kane, how do you keep him given he hasn't signed a a new contract and his current deal is running down? So it's a very, very worrying time as far as the next two weeks is concerned. It's like we were saying earlier, Darren, isn't it? And and Ricky and all the viewers and listeners, some some people in the chat are saying, you know, that you obviously haven't been watching the whole show, to be fair, but we were saying right at the beginning of the show about um, that that's like doors moment and ultimately, you know, the, the board and the club backing. You can't burn another manager. You cannot let this guy walk away. You cannot do it. If you do this, if you do this, we are going to be, we are going to be mid-table. We are. We are going to be mid-table. It doesn't matter who else get, we're going to bring in Tuchel, another ex-Chelsea manager. What's that? Five. There's a love affair going on there with ex-Chelsea managers. You can't do it. You can't let him walk away. He's starting to build a system out. If you back the guy, Kane probably stays. Conte signs a contract. You've got some, you know, Son's having a poor season, but you know he's, you know, deep down you know he's world class. And 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 this this change around the uncertainty around the club, around the fans, around everybody that we're talking about has come from the fact that we've got a manager who's got less than six months left on his contract. We've got our star striker that's been with us since you know since he was ten years old. who's only got eighteen months left on the contract. We were promised years and years ago when Sol Campbell done what Sol Campbell did. Daniel Levy said that will never happen again. So in other words, if Kane goes into the final year of his contract, he's sold. Because he's not going to let him walk away for free, unless again he, he, he is making a line. He, you know, you can't let Kane walk away for free. But Kane might say, "Well, I'm going to walk away for free." Do you know what I mean? Like because he, he might st- stay around another year. So this situation around their contract, we could have sorted this out in the World Cup break. We could have come back from the World Cup. I'm just saying that we could have done this. Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. We could have had Contre, uh, Con- uh, Conte sorry, on a two-year extension. We could have, based on that uh, two-year extension, we could have then signed Kane because Conte's committed his future. We could have been coming back from the World Cup going, boom, look at that, Conte. Boom, look at that, Kane. And then we could have gone and signed Poro on day one of the, on the transfer window. I reckon we'd have turned Arsenal over just for, for them things. Uh, and, and we've done this wrong. This is what, I, I, don't, I don't have the inside knowledge of the football club, but something's going on in there for them not to want to do that. And, and you know, it, it's become this chicken and egg scenario where Conte's saying, well, you've got to back me, otherwise I'm not signing. And the, and the club are almost going, well, you've got to sign us, we're not going to back you. And I, and I kind of get that. Like, why would we give out 50, 60, 80 million or whatever to a manager that's going to walk away and fight? So we're just not going to yeah. do that either. So, But but the, the intelligent people that are at this football club and Paratigi and Conte, they need to sort it out. Because yet again... It is us, the people that pay our money every single week, that are the ones that are hurting and the ones that are seeing 
clubs around us yet again just fly off into the distance. We've got Chelsea that are, forgive me, I ain't seen the table, so I can't bear to look at it after, uh, after Sunday. But Chelsea are what, like eighth in the league? Liverpool are like sixth or whatever in the league, a few points behind us or whatever. We've got Newcastle, they haven't even spent loads of money yet. They're above us. I mean, just, I don't want it to be ranty, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not normally like this, but I have to say, like, it, it, there's only so much you can take as a Tottenham fan. There's only so much you can take, you know, and we take a lot. And, and we, we, we don't deserve anything. No, no one in this world deserves anything unless you work hard for it and you go and get after it and, and, so, and so on and so forth. But the amount of suffering, except from a football sense only, I'm only talking about football sense, the amount of suffering and dross that we've had to see over the years, we do deserve a bit of fortune. And we, we deserve to be backed. And you cannot let Conte walk away. And I just want to quickly say on Conte, I did a poll. It's only on social media. I understand that. There's a lot of people, a few people in the chat saying Conte out. I did, a, I think it was before the Liverpool game, Darren, I think before we lost 2-1, uh, or, or just after the Liverpool game. Conte in, Conte out. 96% of the vote was Conte in and 12,000 people voted. So it's quite a good poll. I've done a quick one today, a uh, poll today. On social media only again it's about six and a half thousand people so a little bit less it's changed but still 71 percent of people want Conte in that voted on, on, on my social on my social media channel so there's still overwhelming support for Conte even though turgid football tactics whatever you want to say it's because we know like you said at the beginning of the show we are one or two players maybe two or three players away from from transforming we were beating Norwich 5-0, Villa 4-0, you know, we're smashing um, Everton 5-0 last year. We beat Leicester this year. We've got it in us, our best start ever to a Premier League season this year, viewers and listeners. It, it happened. So, as quickly as Arsenal have turned it around, we can turn it around. But we Lee, won't, unless we're back. Can, can I ask you, Lee, it, it, and, and maybe everyone listening, I'm seeing all the comments still coming in. If For those people who do feel that Conti should go, who would you have in? Because me personally, I think if you lose Conti, it's hard to suggest that you're an ambitious club anymore, given that you have a guy who knows how to win titles, who knows how to win the Premier League title, and who knows how to build a team and set teams up. And again, very quickly, we talked about it before at the show, you play a five because Spurs can't defend at the moment. But if you do get that quality, then you can open up and have that extra man in midfield in attack. So if you were to lose Conti, who would you have? I think the resounding name coming out is still Pochettino, which tells you everything about this football club that I don't know whether I know I, I've, I have tried to steer away from this. I do want to ask Darren about a several a number of transfer targets. Now, again, I'm conscious that the time's ticking away and I do want to squeeze his in. But the thing with Pochettino, Dow, is that, you know, ultimately there's a man at his peak. There's a, there's, a man at his, there's a man at his peak there that got Spurs into a number of semi finals. My argument is that I think tactically he wasn't good enough in those finals, didn't get Spurs over the line. And I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I was one of those people that, towards the end with Poch, I felt it was the right time for him to go because, number one, the club didn't back him. And number two, he lost a lot of those players in that dressing room who no longer believed in the project. And if you have a group of players that no longer believe in the project, how can you possibly replace 10, 11, 12 players? And that's what I felt it come down to with Maurizio. And I've got, again, Maurizio, as Lee said earlier, he loves the football club. Uh, I think it's been put on record that he feels his unfinished business here. But again, with Pochettino, there's still, as Lee ruled off earlier, you've got eight or nine players that are still here from that era. Yeah, yeah. And this is the problem. Sorry, Lee, just very quickly. This is the problem. Changing the manager for me will not work. You have to upgrade the playing staff. If you look at the other teams that are competing for the title, they have upgraded their playing staff. They have been decisive in the transfer market. They have brought in quality. If you look, sorry to use Arsenal as an example, but you look at both, both fullback positions at Arsenal, got Tierney or Zinchenko on one side, Ben White or Tomiyasu on the other. That's just the fullback positions. They have quality in, and they have that defensive platform to build on. Why are Newcastle in the top four? Because they have that defensive platform to build on. Imagine how secure a team you would be with that kind of balance with Son and Kane scoring the goals, even allowing for Son's sort of dry spell at the moment. But at the moment, the reason you start matches tentatively 
is because there isn't that defensive confidence in the side. And that's the reason why this next two weeks are going to be crucial, I would say, in the recent history of the club. I agree. Yeah, I, agree. Uh, I, just, I just want to pick up on that point. So again, it's a riveting conversation for me because I'm not going to name the players. I think everybody can make their own mind up. But the fact of the matter is people are saying Conte hasn't got the better out of players. Yes, he has. Last season, we got into the top four. And not he still season, had the right Not, not this season, for my opinion. Head. Sorry. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, at the end of the day, he did get the, but you can't keep getting a tune out of a, a broken guitar. You know, you, you can only do it for so long, and he needs upgrades. You know, the, 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 for me personally, what I want the football club to come out and say is we're backing the manager, we've given him a two or four year, uh, four year deal, which he's signed. And we've locked him in because we want to um, we, we want to keep our best players, the Canes and whatever of this world, and we know that we can do that with this project or with with Antonio Conte. And we're going to go and sign the best players that we that he needs in them positions. And then if it then fails, then fair enough. I think even when it fails, then at least you can then say, well, we gave it a go. You know, what, what is the point in getting the best? one of the best managers in the world, and they're not giving it a go. What's the point? You may as well just stack with Nuno. Like it's, it's completely pointless. So I just... Sorry, Rick. I, I'll no, it's fine. Talk. It's fine. I'm, I'm rambling. Now, we're currently 18 days into the transfer window. For those that listen back to this on their morning commute, if they're still listening, you are. You're an absolute champion and a hero. So thank you so much. We know you love last one. Spurs, if you're, still, you're still here with us. Um, right. Pedro Porro. I, I do find it bizarre that I'm asking you about players when I don't even know the manager's going to be at the start of next season. That's just my opinion. I, I just find it crazy right now. That's just me. I'm not saying that you've got to answer that. But where are we, where are we Darren, Darren, with Pedro Porro? It feels at the moment that Sporting are holding out for this release clause. There'll be Spurs fans and likely so like me saying, act like a big club if you want him, go and get him. I know there's that element where a release clause means, especially I think in uh, Portugal or Spain, that you have to pay the full free up front in one go. And contrary to the fact how rich Spurs are, there aren't many clubs that just have 45 million euros to throw at a player. But given if this is a player Conte wants, I have to say that I want him to go and get the player that he needs. So do we know where we are, Darren, with Pedro Porro at the moment? Yeah, what we know is that they won't be meeting the release clause. Um, I mean, listen, the Premier League is cash rich and, and clubs outside the Premier League are well aware of that, which is why they are able to... Um, stand their ground and get uh, top dollar for the players that they are prepared to sell. Shakhtar actually a good barometer for that because they knew that Chelsea were good for it. So they held their nerve when Arsenal were trying to structure deals and they've ended up with the player, uh, with the money that they wanted for their player. Poro, obviously, um, it, it's slightly lower profile, but a wonderful player. Um, and they're going to hold their nerve, which is why the two clubs will keep talking. I have to say, I am confident, just given the fact that the club have identified Poro and are having the conversation, suggests to me that they accept there is a need to improve in that position. And for that reason, I do believe that they'll get that particular deal done. It might be that they've got to pay a little bit more than they intend to, but I think the situation, the combination of the things that we've discussed so far on the show they all point to the club being aware of the concerns, the aware of the deficiency in quality in that position and aware of the fact that in Poro lies a solution. So I believe that deal will get done within the next week or so. That's good news, Darren. That's good news. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> we need some news. Uh, I don't know if you news. want to ask uh, Darren a situation regarding Trossardly. I don't know if you want to bring that into play. I mean, another player that we've been linked with quite heavily. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, of course. I mean, Trossard. You know, reports come out this week that that we'd offered a, a twelve million for him, and, and I know, like, to be fair, I know that frustrates a lot of people. But when you see what his agents come out and said quite publicly, he, 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 he uh, released a statement, didn't he, about the fact that uh, the manager Zebre is it that doesn't really want to play him. There's a bit of a bust up on that sort of stuff. Maybe there is a you know the vultures, if you like, circling to get uh, uh, get him on the cheap. Um, so I don't necessarily have a problem with that 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 first offer at twelve million. But do you, do you think that 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 Trossard is a possibility for Tottenham? Um, yes, in a word, um, Tottenham like him. 
um, and Tottenham have had a conversation over him. The thing about Trossard is that Chelsea like him as well. The agent is offering him to a lot of clubs. His mm -hmm. broken relationship with De Zerbi at Brighton has broken down. He wasn't in the squad uh, for the impressive win at the weekend. And his contract is running down. I think he had six months left, but they've activated the uh, year, option so that he has yeah. another year, so that they don't leave him on, they don't lose him on the cheap. And they've been talking that, that, about the fact that they want their full valuation for him. But to be fair, I would imagine that's around about twenty-five to thirty million pounds, uh, and easily achievable. If I'm Trossard and I look at Chelsea, I see a squad that's being rebuilt packed with quality and I think to myself am I going to play every week whereas if, if he goes to Spurs, I mean, you could argue if he comes to Spurs maybe that might not necessarily be the case even at Spurs because you do have quality you know and, and for your money do, do you think he starts every week if, if Trossard comes to Spurs? He's a squad player, isn't he? I think he replaces yeah, Lucas Moura, doesn't he? I mean, Lu Lucas Moura, uh, again, it's <laughs> by all accounts. We know in Lucas that he's effectively going to be a free agent in the summer. I think, in the most polite way, I think he has got, I think he's got nine uh, involved, seven nine, two. not yeah, seven, yeah, two, seven goals, yeah, two seven goals but, two assists this season. I mean, it's not a ter 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 terrible record. Thing. But guys, is this a new thing? And viewers and listeners, like, is this a new thing about being a squad player or not? You know. Yeah, maybe I'm old school, but you know, you take you're confident enough to go to a, to a team and then get in the team. You know, like oh, is Jack Grealish a squad player? You know, you, you're 100 million, but then that well, I'm going to win trophies. But yeah, you might win trophies, but you might pay 20 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it's up to Trossard to come in and say, "All oh, right, boss, come and have a look at me. Yeah. Like, play yeah. me." Like, isn't it? I, I don't know. Like, maybe I'm too old school, Darren Ricky. No, no, no. I, th I, th I think you're absolutely right. right. It, but Trossard is making the step up. So it's for Trossard to basically show, prove that he has that quality to be able to compete with the sides that, that would, would, with the players that he's stepping up to, to the level that he's stepping up to from a club perspective. Yeah. To answer the question be from before, the conversations are being had, but the, uh, the agent, the, the, his representatives, are speaking to lots of clubs so you can't really say with any certainty that that one is is definitely going to happen um particularly given the caliber of club that's in for him but he's a good player and you know he provides that creativity that ability to get him behind he does score goals as well i like him as a player and i think he'd be a good signing for spurs the only thing i do think and this is just a personal opinion I think the business that Spurs do in this window should be defensive. Absolutely. And, and if it were the case that it was at the expense of losing a, a Trossard, I don't think that's necessarily the end of the world. Spurs oh, need to improve their defence for me. I, I, I totally agree. And I think that's the, that's another criticism, I suppose, that we've we've seen, you know, j just over the last few weeks or so uh, around Conte, where he come out in a couple of press conferences ago, and I'm not expecting him to say, these are the players that I want. This is how much we're going to spend for them. You know, this is how much we're going to pay in wage. I'm not expecting that. But he actually come out and said, no, no, we're okay at centre-back. And you're like, really? Like, because you're a world-class manager. So for, uh, maybe I shouldn't be questioning you, but we're not okay at centre-back, especially when we're playing three of them. You know, we, we're just really not okay at centre-back. So for me, come back to the point you made earlier, Darren, it, I, it has to be defensive for me. Poro, uh, or a right wing-back, but... If it's Poro, it looks like the the business. Let's get Poro in, and I'd be very happy if we went. And so Virgil Van Dijk was signed for seventy five million in a January transfer window when Liverpool were twenty two points behind the uh, Man City at that point, and he still went there. And that's because of certain things, and they were scouting him in that in that in that summer, I think, and so on and so forth. It can be done. We we can go and play, and it doesn't have to be big money. It just has to be a excuse my language, language, a bloody good player. Like, there is some bloody good centre-backs out there. We need to go and find them. Spurs, come on, yeah. we've got a... I think one of them, uh, I don't know, Darren, if you've got any on this name, uh, Piero Hinchapi. I think he has been linked to both Everton and Newcastle in recent days. Do you know if that's a player Spurs are potentially looking at? Maybe maybe not for this window, but for the summer? Is that a name you are aware of him. He's, he's a young player. He's 20 years of age. He's a left-sided yeah. centre-half. He's Ecuadorian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a good player. I, I don't think he's one for this window, and, and understandably so, because I think as far as uh, Conti is concerned, he needs experience, he needs leadership, yeah. he needs organisation, and that, yeah. that 
are the things that Bastoni, for example, would have brought to the club. Um, I know Guardiol is, is world class, as we all know. Wonderful uh, player. Uh, Guardiol, uh, you know, if, if he's available, the likes of Spurs will, sorry, Spurs, the likes of Chelsea will be in for him because, you know, they can afford a player of that ability. They've been sniffing around him for quite some time and they're very, yeah. very keen to land him. And, and that's the frustration that Spurs have in the position that they're in at the moment. Yes, they're in the knockout stages of the Champions League, but the problem they have is that in the Premier League, that they are in a position where they're looking up at the top four. So these players, these top players that we're talking about, it's that much more difficult. And that's even before you get to the expenditure. I know we're over an hour. I just want to just one thing, Darren, before I just finally ask you on a right-back situation. This, this keeps coming through. Ricky Sachs, are you in, in or in out? Look, I think I said this earlier in the show, and I'm getting frustrated by being asked this question. We, um, too, we've done an hour on this show where we've spoke heavily about the ball. And I'm concerned with, I don't want to put a journalist in an uncomfortable position where we keep on hammering him and hammering him about asking about Enoch and the board. I think Darren has made it clear what his viewpoint is on the board. And I think if you've listened to last one on Spurs or watched last one on Spurs in the last five, six, seven years, I think I've made the point. How much more clearer can I say on this current board where I've said it time and time and time again that in every window, I feel like we have not done enough. I don't know what more I can say on that. In terms of being Enoch in or Enoch out, for me... I'm top for me, it's not about the ball. For me, it's about Tottenham as a club. There is no agenda. There's nothing that's off limits here. Do I want to see the ball do more? Absolutely. Would we all welcome a change that would benefit the football club? Absolutely. Would we all want investment in the football club? Absolutely. Do we want Spurs to be successful? Absolutely. And I think it's unfair to try and put people in categories about being in or out. All we all want is the club to be successful. That's not me bottling the question. That's not me dismissing it. But I can't be much clearer when we do this show twice a week. We have a number of real top guests come on, contributors, journalists that come on the show. And we put the challenging questions to them. And I don't want to make, again, a journalist in Darren's class feel uncomfortable to keep battering him and asking about Enoch when he's made it very clear what his position is. And I think we've also made that position clear. We all want change. We all want what's best for the club. We all want to see the club be successful. The most important thing is seeing this club go and win trophies. It's a travesty where we are right now that we're 18 days in a transfer window and rather than being excited about playing City on Thursday we're dreading in it and we don't know what's around the corner that's the sad thing so I hope I've made that clear where we are right now we want what's best for the football club I think we're better when we're all together that's the most important thing I think we saw that at the back end of last season with Tottenham that when we came together for Arsenal last season the fan base were a massive massive reason why the club got top four because we were together we were united we had a purpose and right now as we saw at the weekend we're all over the place at the moment there's blame accountable for every area from the board to the manager to the players every section of there has a blame 100 percent and we've never diverted away from that lee hasn't diverted away from that darren hasn't diverted away from that tonight but we just try and keep things respectable on last one spurs we always have been and we always will be. We won't cross the line. We'll always be respectful. Sorry, Darren, that's why I had to get off my chest. Um, <laughs> All right, that's they no problem. They won't, they won't I've just, uh, just had a couple of people texting me saying they're enjoying what you're saying, so keep talking. Oh, appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> why do I keep on talking? Listen, not everyone's going to... My wife doesn't, but there you go. Um, <laughs> Darren, right, right wing... Mine right. too, so don't worry about no, that. Don't worry. Maybe we could just put them all together and give us a break from it. God, OK. Uh, right wing back. Right wing back. Um, we have currently got there at the moment Emerson Royale, Matt Doherty, Jed Spence. And the situation that we're in is that if Spurs were to look to bring Pedro Porro in, you can't imagine we'd have four there at right wing back. So out of those three, is there one you feel more likely that's going to be leaving the club out of those three that Spurs have got at the moment there? Not as far as right wing back is concerned, I I like Ped, Pedro Porro, um, and I think he's he's young enough and of the profile to be able to do a good job for the club. In terms of who goes, and is that what you're suggesting? Who do you know? Who, yeah, I mean, like I say, if, if the club are going to follow up on this interest and eventually bring Porro in, you can't imagine they would bring him in when you've got, as I've said. 
those three still at the club in terms of Emerson Royale, Jed Spence, Matt Doherty? Is there one that you feel is more closer to the door than the other based on Pedro potentially coming into the club? I, I think uh, Royale would leave. Um, he is an honest pro, but he just doesn't have the equality, the awareness. He does have uh, a lot of the, the willingness, but I, I just don't see him long term as a player that um, will be in Conti's plans. Whereas if you look at Doherty, I, I think Doherty at least at some level is able to to do what is asked of him. Uh, and I, you look at Spence, Spence has youth on his side and long term he could improve into being the kind of player that Conti wants. But right now he wants experience. And if you look across the, the, the defences of the teams ahead of Tottenham at the moment, they have experience and leadership and organisation and defensive discipline. And that's why I, I think that... <laughs> why is everyone on this uh, broadcast at the moment unhappy with Royale? He's not a bad guy, but he just doesn't have that defensive discipline. And when you watch him play, there is always an alarming moment where he's caught out of position, he's caught in possession, um, or he is the weakest link uh, in, in that Tottenham defence. I think he'd go. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, are we wrapping up now, Rick? Or uh, Well, I, I, I say we kept down for over an hour, Lee. Like I say, feel free to eat more. You, I feel like I say we've... Uh... <laughs> I'll drive the bloke absolutely bar me around, like I say, with the club at the moment. I mean, what are we? We're 18 days in. It's a case of waiting and seeing, Lee, unless you've got anything more to ask, Darren, on the I'm topics. Just, I'm just going to ask about the goalkeeper situation. You know, Hugo Lloris, you know, I've been one of his biggest, biggest fans. You know, I've got some class around Hugo Lloris. I don't think you become bad overnight, but he's made three errors, obviously, uh, directly for in, in the Premier League, resulting into goals this season so far, and probably more in the Cups as well. He, he hasn't had a good... Uh, post World Cup, should we say? Um, and you mentioned at the beginning of the show that, that, that there's some efforts to to kind of look at replacing him in the summer. Is there is there anyone maybe that you could see that would fit into Tottenham? I, mean, I, I put a, I do love a bit of a social media poll. I put another social media poll out. It, it didn't get that many votes. I think it's about eight thousand or whatever. Uh, but thirty six percent of the votes was Pickford, and and that would have been my choice to be fair. Um, homegrown, uh, England's number one. I miss I miss singing that since the Robbo days. So I just wondered whether or not you had maybe inside information, but is there anything that you would think that Spurs would go for a goalkeeper like that? I mean, Raya has been uh, mentioned as well, Darren, to be fair. So I just wondered if, he, if you've got any thoughts on that goalkeeper situation. Um, yes, um, I, I think as far as uh, the goalkeeping situation is concerned, one name that I've heard that, to be fair, he has admirers up and down the Premier League is Melier at Leeds. Um, he's a young keeper. Um, Bielsa obviously set a lot of store by him. Um, Jesse Marsh obviously um, playing him at the moment. Bayern Munich, really big fans of him as well. Chelsea like him too. A lot of people like him. Um, Sanchez at Brighton is another one. Yeah, who, who's a really good player. player. He's a good player. Um, and he's got, you know, the, the Sanchez at Brighton, he's got that command of his box. He is um, a very good, I, I don't like to say, I don't like the phrase shot stopper, because if you're not a good shot stopper, you shouldn't really be a goalkeeper, to be fair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 just, I, I do like him. I do like David Raya at Brentford as well. Um, a, a wonderful player. Um, I think... It's hard to put your finger on which one. I think all of them would come to the club because for all that's been said and for all the frustration, Tottenham are still a huge club uh, in the Premier League and they do have fantastic infrastructure. They've got a wonderful team as well if they can sort out those areas where they have deficiencies. Um, but I do know that there are lots of players Lots is probably stretching it a bit, but there are a number of players that Tottenham are looking at, and they should be. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, Hugo Lloris has been at Tottenham for 10 years, and he's been a wonderful servant in that time. He's won the Champions League in that time, but there were moments. I was at the Wolves game at home last season and the Southampton game at home last season where there were mistakes that were self-inflicted. And 
he would have been disappointed with those. So this is not happening him as such. But what you do need is A, that consistency in goal. A goalkeeper that's actually going to be worth eight to ten points a season if you're going to be challenging higher up the league. And you need that genuine competition for that place. When Mendy isn't playing well at Chelsea, Kepa is able to get in there. And Spurs at the moment don't have that ability to maybe put Loris under threat enough. And that's a big part of why that position has now become an issue. Yeah. Down no, so we've Thank kept you over an hour and 10 minutes. Probably the final question we're going to ask you, maybe to close it from your perspective, is that, look, we have got what's remaining, what, 13, 14 day left, days left of this transfer window. How many players do you genuinely see Spurs bringing in signings-wise between now and the end of this January window in terms of a number? That's a really good question. Um, I think for all we've said about the goalkeepers, I don't think that that situation will be sorted out this month. I, I think it will be in the summer when that situation is addressed. Of course, Lloris got the new contract very recently. Uh, so he will be at the club regardless of who comes in in the summer, unless he wants to go anywhere else and play regular first team football. But he's such a pro and he loves the club. He's very committed to the club. So I could see him being the top pro that he is. If somebody younger were to come in, staying around to kind of help him uh, and, and help the club as far as that's concerned. How many players would come in? I, I would think two left-sided centre-half and right full-back, wing-back. But I'm a little bit nervous that it would just be one, and that would be a concern. I think if you were to get to, and because <laughs> Romero is a wonderful player, but Dyer's I, been I, culpable I, for one I, or two. I'm terrified think. now. I'm terrified, Dad, of doing this show if you're <laughs> telling me it's one sided. And I, I honestly, you know, I do so I do love last one on Spurs, but my God, that would be. I think now. I think. Listen. I think everyone knows. I've got. I've got. I've got. I've got, a, I've got a baby that's due in the next six to eight weeks, and um, I think that's a really good time now. Where you take over and with Lee and I just go on a break <laughs> on, a, on a permanent maternity leave. I don't know what I've got coming my way. If you're telling me one sided, at least you can have paternity leave, uh, Rick. You, you'll get. You'll get a break from it, mate. Happy days. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think. Look, I, you know, I, I think that. I think you're right. I, I think that. The first time in in what felt like months we had Son. I know he's had a uh, he's had a terrible season so far, and even he'd be the first to admit that. But it was the first time in months that we had Son, Kane, Kulusevski, and Richarlison fit, um, and that didn't make no difference, did it, to the, to the result of the weekend? But it was the first time that they were back from an attacking perspective. Um, I, I think we're, we're we're in better shape now with Brian Hill actually doing what he's been doing. But we have got to sort the defence out, you know. Leagues and titles, cups, whatever, they're one on defence. That's that's ultimately where they are. That's the foundation. And when you look at an Italian world, world-class world manager that's leaking and shipping goals like we are, it doesn't compute, does it, guys? It's just it's just weird. So I do I do agree. We need to, yeah. to get some reinforcements in defence. Yeah. Finally, Dale, where can everyone find the wonderful work you do? I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to send two thousand Spurs fans to your mentions, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I to say, not after this, Darren, not not Darren's after this, fault by the way. Too. Now, after this, you will, I promise you, Dale, you will not hear from me until the summer. No, no. Listen, listen. I tell you what. Point, I, by which point, Dale has changed career by then. <laughs> yeah, well, probably. Um, I, I always love coming on this show. Um, you've got. It's always a good conversation. You've got a terrific um, set of fans who who and and I, I always. Sometimes when you come on, it's very easy to believe that you as a journalist, you, you come with, with all of the knowledge and the insight, but actually it's the fan base who, 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 who've got the knowledge and the insight. And um, and I, you learn a lot so much from not being, you know, journalists, it's very easy to believe that. Um, it, no, it's important to be aware that sometimes the view within the journalistic fraternity isn't the prevailing view. Very often, the rank that the, you know the fans who pay to get into games, to watch games, to watch players, to watch younger players as well, to watch reserve team players as well, to get an insight into the the, the bigger picture. They are an education to us. So 
you know, I'm always really pleased to come on and I'll come on whenever I can. Um, I'll be back on the Super Sunday Match Day show uh, this coming Sunday uh, with Vicky Gomesall. And obviously we'll have a lot to talk about this coming weekend because you guys play Manchester City on Thursday night. Give me a score prediction, guys. Oh, God. Oh my God. I mean, we are their bogey team. That's the only thing I would say. We're their bogey team. And the last time we went to play them at the Etihad, I think it was back-to-back -back defeats that we had going into that game, if you if you remember. I think it was the Saints and the Wolves. I think yeah. I remember. Um, and we ended up turning them over. Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't see us... I no. can't see us winning, but I'm not, I can't predict a loss either. I can't. I can't do it to. to I can. Team. I can. It's gonna be. It's gonna be three one Man City. I'll go, I'll go one one. I'll go one one. It's gonna be three one Man City, and me and Maka are back with you on Thursday for instant reaction to that. We're looking forward to that. That we are. The wonderful yeah. Darren yeah. Lewis back on last one's word. Lee, thank you, thank you so That's much, Dale. Dal, thank you so much, guys. There you thank go. You, it's been an hour and fifteen of hopefully some therapy. But listen, we're not the ones that have to try and find a solution. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll let you decide. But listen, signing out from the wonderful Lee McQueen, from the brilliant Darren Lewis, from myself. Guys, as always, please keep safe, keep well, keep some faith. And as always, come on you Spurs.